All right, everyone. Good to see you this wonderful evening. <laughs> Wednesday. Groundhog Eve. 2-1-20-23. Groundhog Eve. All right. Well, we're going to continue in our study. We've just got a few more weeks of this. And... Uh, we're going to talk about the crown of life tonight. We talked about the crown of righteousness. And we're going to talk about the crown of life tonight. And I want us to note something that each one of these crowns, as we look at them, uh, have uh, attached to them uh, some form of suffering uh, for the faith. It doesn't, uh, every one of them has some form of suffering. Uh, for the faith in some form or fashion. Uh, the connotation is in each one of them. Um, when we were looking at the one last time in 2 Timothy 4, Paul said there was a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, would give him and anyone who loves the Lord's appearing at that day and he leads that sentence off with the word henceforth, which he points back to fighting the good fight of faith and finishing the course and keeping the faith, guarding the faith. And, of course, it cost him his life to guard the faith. It may not cost us our life to guard the faith, but it may cost us relationships. It could cost us, it's cost me promotions in my former job before. It cost you getting in good with the in crowd that runs the world. You know that. Uh, it can cost you a lot more than you would. And we're not supposed to count the cost, as the song says. Uh, there's one passage in one song that says, "If you count, have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? But also, uh, don't bother to count the cost of being faithful. Uh, there is a cost to that. Uh, the scorn of the world. Um, sometimes the scorn of one's family. Uh, the scorn of, uh, uh, of others in your neighborhood perhaps sometimes, that uh, the loneliness that comes as a result of that because you miss their company, you, you don't miss their complaining, but you miss their company. Um, you miss the uh, gathering because uh, you always look like you're the third wheel all the time, fifth wheel or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then for some, uh, Yet today in parts of the world they're still being persecuted, some even unto death for uh, standing up for the faith and guarding the faith, not turning their back on the faith. In the early church, the post-apostolic fathers and some of those for years afterward followed until Constantine outlawed the ban against persecuting Christians in around 330 B.C., somewhere in that area. Um, they were burned at the stake. Uh, used as bait in the Colosseums. You know those stories. And um, it was basically open season on those who kept and guarded the faith. And typically those who were put up, put burned at the stake or put into the Colosseums for entertainment were the lions and the dogs to tear apart. That's what those large mastiffs were, the original breed anyway. Um, they were given the opportunity to uh, turn their, to give up on their faith and to renounce their faith. And when they didn't, uh, they died a martyr's death. And um, they weren't thinking about a crown. They were just thinking about, you know, keeping their faith. And uh, sometimes when you're in a crowd, you may be finding it hard to hold your faith because you know what type of crowd you're in. But when you do, um, you know what the fallout is, but then again, you become the light that someone might come to talk to later or the week after or whatever uh, because they realize that you stood up for what was right and said what was right, and uh, you weren't afraid to uh, guard or keep the faith and keep on the path. But every one of these crowns, it appears, uh, that has a connotation of suffering that goes with it. And the one tonight is no, none less, and this is James chapter 1 and verse 12. But before I get to that, uh, again, that's our uh, 
main passage on this. This is basics number 542, and this is lesson 12 when it comes to the eternal rewards part of the doctrine of uh, eternal rewards, the imputation of blessings in eternity. And Paul expected the crown of righteousness. The indicative mood in which the way that was written in the Holy Spirit chose to have that word used uh, in the original language. That's the genius of the Koine Greek. It is set, it's a dead language for one thing. Now there is still uh, uh, a regular Greek that is speak, spoken still today. And there was the Attic Greek. But then the Koine Greek was basically what they called the common marketplace language, the basic Greek that Alexander wanted to see that all the people that were in his empire, the Greek, uh, Grecian empire, that, uh, that way they could communicate uh, with everyone. And so it became, it was already pretty much uh, common among the uh, some, uh, the Hellenist, uh, but some of the others it was not. But anyway, uh, it was the perfect time for there to be the writing of the New Testament uh, when that was the common language. God used the providence of the uh, Koine common Greek uh, of that day uh, to have the New Testament written in for the most part. Uh, some of, A little bit Jesus had it was an Aramaic. Oh, of course he could do any language he wanted. <laughs> but that they was, basically his language was Aramaic. But um, when they wrote it, they would write the scripture in this Greek language in the New Testament. And, of course, the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. You know that. So anyway, it's a specific language. And Paul said, I, ex I will get the crown of righteousness, and so will those also that love the Lord at his appearing or his coming. But that verse is started off with the word henceforth. It's based on faithfulness. It's not based on being too cowardly to live the Christian life. But sure, we'd like to get out of here and go to heaven. It has that to do with living a noble life as a Christian. And this is what we're going to look at somewhat tonight. Every time God blesses you as a believer in Christ Jesus, what he is doing is blessing his own imputed righteousness in you and me. That's what he's doing. Uh, we're blessed by our eternal association with Jesus Christ and for no other reason. If we were not associated in faith in Jesus Christ, God would not have a target for sending down his imputed or his given blessings. And so every time that God blesses you, it is a reflection of his glory. And so every time he is glorified, you become a recipient of a piece of that blessing and a piece of that glory you can't handle but so much I can't handle but so much while I'm here on this earth our old sin nature would get all puffed up and we would think we're all that in a bag of chips we wouldn't want us to have the, the thorn in the flesh put upon us that Paul had put upon him and uh, there's some speculation as to what that thorn in the flesh was other than just bad eyesight I think it was much more uh, adverse than that but every time God blesses us, he's blessing us because we're saved. And he's targeting his imputed righteousness because if we are saved, he can do that without violating his divine justice. So when we receive eternal life and we receive the imputation of the righteousness of God, those two things combined together set us up for a tremendous amount of blessing, not only in time but also in eternity. And so when the rapture of the church takes place, uh, that's when you'll get your resurrection body. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it may happen while you're still alive. It may happen, the rapture may happen, which is the resurrection of the company B of the four companies of believers. Company A is Christ. He's the first fruits of the resurrection of a body. The Old Testament saints don't have resurrected bodies yet okay they have a temporary body for their soul and spirit but they don't have resurrection bodies yet they won't get theirs until the beginning of the millennial kingdom 
they're with the Lord, but they won't get their resurrection bodies until their group is finished, as per Daniel chapter 12, I think verse 12 and 13, and also 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23. But you'll get your resurrection body before they get theirs. And Paul hasn't gotten his yet because it's not done as you die and get to heaven. It's done when the group is all consummated together. That's when that resurrection uh, will take place. The resurrection for the New Test for the church age is the rapture. Okay, that's what the rapture is. And there you receive your resurrection body. And after the beam of seat judgment takes place, then you will receive your glorified body. That's Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. You'll receive then your glorified body. Okay, everything that he needs to purge for the sense of bringing blessing, showing his eminence through you. That's what will be going on in eternity. He will be showing his eminence through you. <laughs> To the degree that you have qualified for by your faithfulness in time, not your works, per se is the quantum, well, your works in that they're gold, silver, and precious stones and not just human good, which is hay, wood, and stubble. But uh, you will get uh, that glorified body after the Bema seat. And Philippians 1 6 says that uh, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, and that will be that day. That's when we are consummated for glorification in heaven. And so it's baked into the plan of God that those whom he saves, he glorifies. He will eventually glorify, not reject at the beam of seat or before that time comes, but if you're saved, it's already baked in the cake that you're going to be glorified, whether you are a jerk as a Christian or not. Now, that is not a license to be a jerk as a Christian because who wants to spend their earthly life in God's woodshed? Only a fool would spend their earthly life as a Christian in God's woodshed. So those whom he has saved, he is going to glorify. It's already baked in. It's already in the mix. It's going to happen. And we, as Jesus Christ, at that time, will have an aura to our existence that we cannot have in this world. There are people who are demigods who think that they have an aura of superiority over human beings. Hitler would have been one of those. That he was superior because of some genetics or whatever. But he was a fool. Now he's, I believe, as you would probably think so, he is in Hades. He's not gotten to Gehenna yet, but he's in Hades. <laughs> awaiting his judgment, which everybody that goes to Hades goes to Gehenna. Because there's not like, well, don't I get a chance to work my way out? No, there's no working your way out. It's pointed to man, if man wants to die, and then the next thing on that person's calendar is the judgment. Going to Hades is not the judgment. Going to Gehenna is the judgment. Going to Hades is just a holding cell until the time comes when all unsaved will be consummated into one wad, taken up to the great white throne at the very end of time, and then put in Gehenna. Anyway, as Jesus Christ did in his resurrection body before he was ascended, he had an aura to his existence. A-U-R-A, -A, of course, that's say it out there. I'll spell it out there. It's like he was like Moses when he came off the mountain and his face did shine, except this was even more than that. And that was only because a little bit of the glory of God uh, slipped and fell off on him. <laughs> Got a little close to the sun, as they say. I always liked it one when Charlton Heston came down off and it looked like he, he went up there in one way. When he came back down, he was a blonde. <laughs> 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 and a blonde glowing beard when he came off of there. <laughs> But we will. I don't know whether or not you'll have a blonde glowing beard or something like that. I, I would guess not. But anyway, we'll have an aura to our existence, and for human beings, uh, for human beings now saved, uh, we will also be free from a body that has been invaded by the sin nature. We were born with it in us, so we will be free from stain of sin. We'll be free from all guilt. We'll be free from longing to belong as children of God finally at home. We'll all have that sense that we're home. And for those who have had doubt of their salvation, though they were saved, that 
uh, that fear is finally over with. Um, we'll be free uh, actually from ever dying again. You won't have that hanging over your head, you know. You'll never go to another funeral. <laughs> you will also all, this is for all believers, you'll be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so that uh, is a wonderful thing. And even some will reign with our Lord in some capacity. In some capacity. All things, all of these things are baked into the cake of our salvation. We will eventually be presented as faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. If you'll slip over just like eight or ten pages right in front of the book of Revelation, uh, well, that's probably no longer more than that, but it's Jude, verse 24, right there, we're right before the book of Revelation. Taught Jude a few times. It's an amazing little chapter of work, letter. But we're going to be presented faultless one of these days before the presence of His glory. We like to think that we're faultless. Now, we are in position, but we know that not always in practice. We, uh, we just we, we know that. Even in your having your best day, you can still be better. When I'm having my best day with the Lord, I can still be better. I can feel, still be more like Christ. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. You can't keep yourself from falling. There are whole church denominations that believe that there's certain things that you can do to keep yourself from losing your salvation. Now him that is able, dunamato is the word that means powerful enough, to keep you from falling and then to present you as faultless. On that, the word present is an aorist tense uh, infinitive, which means that a train has already left the station in God's viewpoint. Present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's going to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, and he's going to do that with exceeding joy and you will have exceeding joy too our bodies are not just given new life our bodies will be highly empowered Jesus just would go from point A to point B just to think it it's not like he had to travel fast like you know somebody in a Marvel comic strip he just appeared to them when he was in the upper room, he just appeared to him, and several times he just uh, there he was. There he was. It's not like you know he struggled to get through a door, or like this show that's on called Ghost. If you've ever seen it, and they go in through an outdoors and walls and such as a, car, a comedy show or whatever. Uh, you just be there. You you're highly empowered. You don't have the uh, carbon-based life form holding you in such a way uh, angels uh, are seen as emanating light and a figure of a man. That's the way they're always seen. Uh, there's no little fat chubby cherub babies. There's no female <laughs> angels uh, like, like all that stuff, you know, like you, they show in ha Valentine's coming up, you know. That's all I want for Valentine's is a little car with a little chubby angel on it. With a little <laughs> Yeah, angels don't have babies, and there's no female angels. They're all uh, all in masculine gender whenever they're mentioned. They're for fighting, for the most part, and they're for serving, for the most part. They don't have children. But our bodies are not just given new life that will never die. They will be highly empowered. Now, one of the theology books that I have, I really wasn't real fond of his definition here in Schaefer's Systematic Theology. He said limitless in power. So I didn't quite like that description so I changed it to highly empowered. Also, also your body will be infinite in glory. In other words, it's going to be awesome. It'll be awesome. There's days when you wish 
you would have a little more awesomeness when you don't feel good, you know. Awesome. Also, people have said often, well, will, will everybody be around the age of Jesus, what, 33 or something? I don't know. I don't know. There are some people you wouldn't recognize unless they were wrinkled. But I don't think it's going to be that way. Because you've, you've got all eternity. I didn't recognize that you had a head of hair in all your teeth. I didn't. Yeah, but it's still me. And you've got forever to get used to the change. All right. But there are also, with regard to the body, it will be eternal in endurance. It won't wear out. It's not going to be this cellular breakdown and then the reconstitution of the cells through some magic food like manna or something that you have to eat to stay alive. Eternal in endurance. Also, it will also be adapted to the spirit and tuned into the plan and the voice of God. It will never be distracted again. We are buried with Christ, the Bible teaches, and yes, but we are also raised with him in glory and sinlessness forever. That's a wonderful thought. Raised in glorification, and for us as believers, of course, Christ was not sinful, but we are, and that will all be gone too, so that will be something that will last forever. Heavenly Father, we ask as we continue in the word, this evening that you will bless us with joy and with edification and with a sense of appreciation even more uh, for what you have prepared for us that is already awaiting. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and we'll get to this lesson a little bit later on, but our glorified bodies then, after we've been through the Bema seat, will be decorated in such a way that will represent those blessings for how we lived in time. This is part of the Pauline theology of how he depicted the believer in eternity. There will be an honor given where honor is due. That's just leave it at that. Don't know to what degree. That will be predicated upon uh, the victory that you have been demonstrated to have won while you were here in time. So there's a lot to live for. After our death or the rapture, whichever cares, creates us getting out of this world first, whatever, after our death or the rapture or either one, we can do no more to earn rewards. Salvation is of grace, but rewards stem from good works which were produced by the Holy Spirit and not human good. Human good can be done by an unsaved person, it can be done by a saved person, but it is for the glory of the individual, not the glory of God. And so that is a reward that you receive that you get for being under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and fellowship with the Lord. That would apply to any crown. So then this next one is the second wreath or the second crown, uh, which is... James 1 and verse 12, which says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. The word receive is a future active indicative verb from the Greek word lambano, L-A-M-B-A-N-O, and it means to take to yourself. If you endure temptation, you will receive. Future active indicative. If it if the if then if the the mood in the Greek text would have been subjunctive, it would have meant maybe yes or maybe no but it's in the indicative, which is affirmative. Which means it's certain. It's, it's the mood of certainty is what it's called. And so that word, the way it is written in the original, uh, means it's in the indicative mood. And that's important because it means there's no element of doubt. You will receive the crown of life. You will take to yourself by the hand of Christ the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that 
love him. Again, this is agape love. And remember, Paul used the same term that love his appearing. And uh, we go back to that again. Agape, who have a love for him. For the Lord has promised that to those who love him and endure temptation. This believer is identified. And loving him was proven by the enduring of the temptation. The enduring of the temptation showed your love for him. Now, this believer here also, I want us to note in verse 12, blessed is <coughs> the man. All right, man here is A-N-E-R. A-N-E-R. Amer. All right, now it doesn't have the word uh, the is missing. When you have the, it was referred to a specific man. Typically, it means males only. Because gene is gu nay would be female only. But when you don't have the word the before it, you have to see it in its original meaning, which means to be a noble person. And you also will have the masculine gender uh, and the antecedent, which you don't have that here. You don't have the definite article. So you have the word the in non-italicized letters, at least in my version you do. But in the original, it's not there in any of the versions. So blessed is a noble person that endures temptation is, I think, the proper translation. You see, the translators did... The translators here we had did not have the originals. They had manuscripts. They don't have the originals. And they're further away from the from the. They're not that much further away when they translated this in 1611. They weren't much more translated farther away from this than we are 400 years later, as far as that goes. So it's not up to them and the translation that we have to dictate to me as a, an expositor what. It is. It's up to me to study what it means. So I actually have more information to study from than they did. Because <laughs> I've got so many other translations that I can study from. And it's amazing that when you study the Texas Receptus, you'll see how they have come to what they've come to. But some of the translations... It's not that specific, but it is when you are a nitpicker like I am. Because this is specific. Because there are some who teach that only a man qualifies for this crown. Because they believe that in that case you should have used the word anthropos. From which we get the word anthropology, which could be a man or a woman. But it's not anthropos, it's on there, which it kind of stumped me when I first saw that. So, I, of course, I, I had to dig in as usual. But that's what I'm supposed to do. And best translation is, blessed is a noble believer that endures temptation. It's believers that get the reward. This is not for unsaved people. But now we're going to have to look at what, what do they mean by temptation? You endure temptations. Present active indicative of the Greek word hypomeno, or you endure that, that strain, that, getting, that pressure. The verb hypomeno for temptation, I mean endure, it means to bear up under a load of great pressure and yet to remain faithful under the Lord's guidance while doing so. It sounds a lot like the one that the crown that Paul, because it's not that far removed from Paul's uh, teaching on the crown uh, of righteousness. So this noble believer does not lose trust in the word of God under trial when he is tried and these were believers in and around Jerusalem who were under a tremendous amount of peer pressure from the Jews who wanted them to go back into the Levitical system for their worship 
It's not. That's why the James is not so far removed from the book of Hebrews because it is very closely associated. But the noble believer does not lose trust in the word of the Lord under trial, even if the trial comes by way of ill treatment or undeserved suffering. Historically, many of the believers in Jerusalem in the first century suffered extreme hardships. You know, Paul was out collecting from the saints, as per 1 Corinthians 16.1. He was out collecting from all the believers in Macedonia and that region to try to take up an offering for those suffering uh, Jews there in Jerusalem. They were scattered saints of the Eastern Dispersion or Dysphoria under Alexander the Great's reign. Many of them were at that time. He said in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. That's the eastern dispersion. That's actually the second dispersion on Alexander the Great. They had suffered not only from abuses by the Roman government now, but they'd also suffered before them, their ancestors, by Alexander's reign as well. And it also suffered under the hands of legalistic, unsaved Jews. So this was a lot of peer pressure, both from family, friends, and the government, business associates, and everybody. This was bad enough, but these honorable men and women of the first century also suffered at the hands of reversionistic, backslidden, carnal believers. The backslidden believers slipped back into some old Jewish religious and traditional practices. They forgot the grace of God, but for believers who were pressing on to maturity and greater grace status, these believers stuck with the New Testament teachings concerning the Lord Jesus Christ as he gave to his apostles. The ritualistic, activity-oriented believers typically, as then, still do, look down their noses and scorn serious students of the word of God. The Marthas chide the Marys in every generation. And the cosmic system, performance-oriented people always seem to trump perception-oriented believers. The behind-the-scenes crowd that puts a lot of thought and planning into the project, of course, are never recognized as much as the ones who do the hard work behind the scenes of keeping the salt of Christianity salty. It's not the showmen that keep the salt of Christianity salty. God looks at... See, man, is, when King David was being picked by Samuel, he thought that David's sons that looked to be militarily fit and trained, that they should be the new king of Israel and Lord told Samuel that God, he doesn't look on the outward appearance like man does. He looks at the heart. And he says, I believe you got one more son out there in the hill somewhere, don't you? Yeah, I got a boy out there keeping the sheep. Let me see him. Bring him in. So while David's brothers are polishing their medals, David's out there fighting the lion and the bear. Praying to God. Getting, getting to know God. Anyway. The Greek word in the text here for temptation in James chapter 1 and verse 12, the word temptation, is pyrosmon, P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-N. This word refers to a testing and trial rather than the everyday temptations of the flesh. And a lot of people, when they look at this verse, they'll think, you know, you resist this sinful. Now, obviously, you just go to the woodshed for that. You don't get a reward for being moral. So I want to put that out there right now. There is no reward for being moral. It is standard operating procedure. It is what we call SOP in the military. It's standard operating procedure for a Christian to be moral. Yeah, we might slip up and say something we shouldn't say or think a thought that we shouldn't think from time to time. That's understandable. Sock somebody in the nose every once in a while, you know, just to keep them honest. No, don't do that. <laughs> Sometimes you can be very spiritual if you do that. No, don't do that, I guess. Shouldn't. But the truth of the matter is, you don't get a reward for being moral. Some believers think that they're going to get a reward for being... There are unsaved people who are more, more moral than some Christians. This is a different kind of trial and testing. Yes, you should be moral. That's just the bottom line. But the truth of the matter is, 
you can show self-restraint with regard to what happens with inside of you. That's on you. But what happens on the outside of you, how do you handle that? How do you handle the pressures of life? This is what this is about. How you handle the daily pressures of life. Yes, you can have what we call give up itis because you let people discourage you. You let your circumstances discourage you or distract you and pull you away from truth. But you won't let that happen. You're not going to let that happen. You're going to stay in the word. You're going to be an old groundhog and you're going to stay in the hole for six more weeks. <laughs> you're staying in the word. And that's what this person does. Keep your nose to the grindstone, in other words. Not looking for some new religion. You found Jesus and there's nothing else that satisfies you. So the word here for temptation is not a word that deals with the lust of the flesh or, you know, the fourth piece of pie at the sit down or got to have this or that. It, that's, that's something different. That's, that's kind of, I hate to say it, we are told in the scripture over and over that we are to crucify the flesh. So that's baked in too. That's supposed to be what we're supposed to be doing. But this is, this is heavy stuff here when it talks about crowns and rewards. This is above and beyond just getting to heaven and getting that wonderful new body and the sinlessness of it and seeing all the stuff that we are just, you know, seeing just little vistas of it in the scripture. This this is where he's, when you come out from the Bema seat, there's going to be an honorable, and I would imagine a parade of sorts. Uh, whatever. Because it's going to honor Christ uh, in that regard. Some of these believers were denied employment in many sectors of their society because they were Christians and, and they had left the Jewish practices. They were outcasts from their own family and friends. Now that might not be what happens to you, but it could. How do you respond to that? How do I respond to that? Do you give up because your family doesn't follow the faith? Well, that's on them. If your family does not follow the faith, that's their choice. They don't make you follow the faith, and you can't make them follow the faith. That's on them. Every man stands or falls before his own master. And if people fall, it will be because they have chosen to walk away, to either reject the gospel, and thus in that case they will go to Hades when they die, and then they'll go to the great white throne after the, the millennium. But you as a believer, how are you going to live your life? These believers did not give in to the pressure to, uh, to abandon their newfound faith in Christ to appease their Jewish peers. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, he says in verse 33, you have become a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and part of why you became companions of them that were so used. Verse 34, Hebrews 10. You had compassion on this writer of uh, on, on, on me and my bonds and took joy for the despoiling of your goods and helped me out. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Now I'd say that would also include this crown. So he says, don't cast away your confidence which has great recompense of reward. Not reward in time, but in eternity. So he's talking about rewards there back in Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 35. Then he says, For then you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. That is, don't give up the ship. Don't throw in the towel, in other words. See, it's always pressure that separates the pure from the tainted. Like heat separates the impurities from gold. Trials are like heat, and they are allowed to come into our lives to to remove the dross or the impurities from our lives. But sadly, some believers are comfortable with their impurities. They're comfortable with it. That's not good. That definitely will not let the person qualify for the crown of life. And this is not just talking about immorality. This is devotion to Christ. Some people could be moral and still be impure from a spiritual perspective because they have no love for Christ. 
The great apostasy, as per 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, that occurs before the rapture of the church, will provide an excellent opportunity for some unusual testing. We may be in that era now, I don't know. Testing that may get some positive believers over the hump to where now, through their trials and testings, they will perhaps receive the crown of life. We're not living in the gladiator times. We're not living in the times of Domitian or Nero and some of the other things that happened during the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. We're not living in those times. Or the times of the wicked king. Of course, you're going back in the Old Testament. That's a different category. But we don't live in in that era of that time. But I think it's coming upon us as Christians to be scorned upon and frowned upon when we stand up for the faith. And so you can only do so much in the time in which you live or the era of which you live to qualify for the crown of life. So the spinoff of believers from the nucleus of sound teaching is going to ever increase And that momentum uh, is like a snowball going down a hill. The the more it goes, the more it picks up in its path. And we have to stay out of that path. It's not our job to bust up apostate thinking. God will bust that up himself. People shouldn't get caught up in apostate thinking. That's on them. They're not victims. They're guilty. God's not going to look at them as victims who get caught up in apostate teachings. Because if they're saved, the Holy Spirit's trying to tell them otherwise. Anyway, but you may, in a time of difficulty like we are right now, uh, in 2023, may position yourself to get over the hump, that is to get into a position to receive the crown of life when you go to be with the Lord, perhaps. Opportunities are abounding. You don't have to look hard for them. But one of the great tests for the believer in the end times, including the 21st century, is submitting to the authority of the Word of God. Paul said that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said it in 1 Timothy chapter 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound teaching or sound doctrine. So without receiving the word of God under the authority of the word of God, there's not going to be any transformation of the life. And without transformation of the life, a person's not going to see where it's worth fighting for the crown of life. So we have to be careful to not take the shallow way to self-fulfillment in life while at the same time assuming that we are advancing to spiritual maturity. There are a lot of Christians who think they are advancing to spiritual maturity, but their brand of Christianity is a brand of self-fulfillment. We're supposed to be getting filled up with Jesus Christ and his word. Emotionalism and sensationalism sensationalism have replaced edification in too many church settings. And this same emotionalism and sensationalism are continued throughout the rest of the week through some program or radio or TV, some internet uh, uh, interactions. That's not how you get to spiritual maturity. There are a few good men still preaching, thank goodness, and still teaching the Word of God. But be careful which ones you pick because there are many that are not conducive to biblical growth. And I will say this to women preachers. You're not qualified to be a preacher. You're not biblically qualified to be a preacher. So it may sound good, but you're shooting a ball out of bounds. And if you're going to be crowned, you're not crowned except you play according to the rules. God's rules not feminist rules. I don't care how good of a teacher you are. You can teach a class if you want to teach a class, but you're not preaching at a church. You're out of line if you're doing that. And there's too many arrogant women who don't understand that. I'm not talking about good women teachers. There are good women teachers. I've got some books in my study by good women teachers, but they know what God expects of them not what their society expects of them. And there are a lot of people, men and women, who will lose their rewards, not because they were not capable, but because they were arrogant. 
they thought they knew better than the Word of God itself. And they try to wiggle around. That's why many people don't teach the Pauline epistles. Because it gets in their crawl. And they have a controversy with God. Not me. Or people that speak the way I speak with the Word of God. But they have a controversy with God. Learning how to earn the crowns is not for the weak of heart. Jesus Christ is a judge. He's not a pansy. And we need to understand that when we go to stand before him, we're not going to get a sloppy, sentimental fool. Too many Christians will think they're going to get over on God because they've gotten over on some clown in the pulpit somewhere or some board somewhere. Not going to happen there. So we've got to, be, we've got to watch out also for materialism. If you can get past that, let me get to this one. <laughs> We're almost done here. We have to watch out for materialism, which is nothing more than covetousness covetousness that is the lust of the eyes so we have to watch out for these things the false doctrines of demons attempt to tell us that we cannot be happy unless we have certain things and some believers will fail to get the crown of life because they they want the crowns of this world's kingdom we've got to watch out for the influence of our culture in this day Influences that say everyone has the right to do that which is right in his or her own eyes. We must watch out for the speed of our culture that says, bring me what I want immediately. Whether it's fast food, fast cars, fast internet, or fast sermons. <laughs> Brethren, we cannot process biblical information in that manner. Understanding God's word takes time. It takes meditation. It takes time taking time to sit and just sit and be with the Lord. I hope all of us here do that, that you take the time to get away from everybody and find your own closet or place. It doesn't have to be a closet. You know that. It's dark in here, you know. A place where you can just secure yourself some time to see the Word and to think. No music on. Just think the Word. Think on it. Pray. James goes on. Why do you think some people used to pray for hours on end? Some maybe, I know some still do. Because they didn't, they had things to clear up and they wanted to get them cleared up. And they had to get them cleared up in their thinking and God's spirit starts talking to you in your prayer. It is a monologue. It is a dialogue. Prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. God talks to you in your prayer and you talk to him. It's not just you know, when you're talking, when God talks to you, you listen. And then there are times when you're seen walking around the yard, your mouth's moving, but nobody knows what you're saying, but you're talking back to God, not in a mean way, but, you know, Lord, why is this happening? You know, so you're talking back. He's speaking to you in different things. I don't know what, I'm sure all of you do that. And if I see you talking to yourself out there, I, 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 I won't turn you in. <laughs> I do it too often. I try not to do it in front of other people. I do. I really do. I don't know how many times Boomer just sitting there staring at me, looking at me. Like, what is wrong with that man? And perhaps that's what you find out too. But understanding God's word takes time. James goes on to say, For when this believer, this man or this woman is tried, they shall receive the crown of life. And the word tried is dokimos, D-O-K-I-M-O-S. And the word dokimos dokimazo it is a word that means more than just you were tested and tried but it also gives the connotation that you have passed the test you've met the approval of the one who was doing the testing and when you have been tried you shall receive the crown of life the, the receiving the crown of life comes after the being tried part that's part of the bema seat right there this noble, honorable believer has been approved by God, in this case the Lord Jesus at the Bema Seat, after having successfully passed his exams. This is a, a test. It's a litmus test. This, and and uh, some people like to think, you know, Lord, just go and get it over with as quick as you can. Make it as painful as you can. Just go and pull the Band-Aid off. <laughs> That's what some believers might be thinking at the Bema Seat. Lord, just... 
pull the Band-Aid off and just, let me get over it. No, because there's a, there's a reward attached to that, um, that thing that's going to be happening. Romans 14, uh, verse 12. Romans 14, 12, we brought this up before. Uh, so then every one of us shall give account. That's, a, that's an accounting term and means that you will give a report of yourself to God. Of course, that's the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ our judge, John 5 and verse 22. So, you passed his examination or you've been tried and you've been found to be an honorable believer. You didn't give up when life seemed unfair. You didn't allow people's circumstances and things to keep you from prevent to prevent you from sticking with the word of the Lord. You didn't always get it. I didn't always get it. But I knew I was getting the right thing. And for this habit of life as a believer, these shall receive the crown of life because you have proved that you love him. You proved that you love him. You proved that you love him. That's virtue love. You didn't always like everything, understand everything, but your unconditional love for the Lord meant that you'll accept the things that come about by way of you living out your faith, come good or bad, little or much. You're going to live for the Lord, understood or not, misunderstood regardless. You're going to continue to stick with the Lord. And there's a crown awaiting for the believer that does it. The Lord, and, and the Lord, and I believe the Lord is specific with these crowns. They're not chintzy, as they say. And when it comes to the rewards, apparently they're they're pretty significant. Uh, but also, um, he wants to give out as many as he can. He doesn't. And you know how many believers have a crown awaiting them? Every believer, because he. Where there is equal opportunity through your circumstances, whether you're living in this century, you're living in this country, you have equal opportunity under God, and He understands what you've been through, where you're at, what you've learned, and what you've been faithful with what you've had. This is not a crown where only three people are going to get it. That's me and Paul. You mean that? No. <laughs> I, for that reason, I won't get one. <laughs> but I'm just trying to say that he wants to give out as many because he makes it possible that every believer can receive maximum, maximum uh, appreciation from him. Maximum appreciation from him. That it doesn't go up in hay, wood, and stubble. That what you did, you did it for the wrong reason. Why did you do it for that reason? Why were you living in a state of carnality for so long like Solomon was? Why did you live that way for so long? You finally got straightened out, but you know there's a big gap in, a, in, in your believer life there, Solomon. What happened to you, buddy? Anyway, it is important. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings, for your kindness to us, for your love. We thank you that you care for us in ways that we can't imagine. That you care for us in ways that we won't fully understand or even recognize until we get to be with you when we'll see how you carried us through uh, the sands of time. When we only saw one set of footprints in the sand when you ca were carrying us. You didn't leave us, you carried us. And so, Father, we are thankful that you carried us. And we ask that you'd help us to learn the words where we'll have the strength to walk along side of you in an honorable way, be used by you uh, where you we're trustworthy uh, with our personal life as well as our public life. So, Father, we just thank you for this day of grace and for all you do for us. And we pray that if you should come back to uh, to get us, your son should come back to get us tonight, that we're ready, looking forward to it. 
and um, and that we've done the best that we know how, that we've uh, kept the faith, we've fought the, the fight, uh, we've kept stayed on course, and uh, that we have endured uh, these trials of life without turning our back on you. And so, Father, we just ask you to be uh, pleased with us and that uh, we'll get the will done at the judgment seat of Christ. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen.